The journey to COP26 in Glasgow has begun and we'll be keeping you up to date every step of the way. Welcome to The Road to Glasgow. I'm Stephen Shiel and this week I'm joined by Luca Karadi and Mike Berners-Lee. So to kick things off, Mike, I want to ask you how you started to work with the local northeast of Scotland businesses to help them achieve a negative carbon footprint. And I'm thinking about Brewdog, which is a very prominent business in Scotland and in particular here in the northeast. How did you get involved with them and what was the process that they went through? So Brewdog got in touch with us because they had um, done two things. One is they had had dinner with David Attenborough uh, and had quite a hard hitting conversation with him. And the other is that they'd read my last book, There's No Planet B. And they basically got on the phone to say, look, we, we get it. There's a crisis going. This has huge implications for all organisations, including our own. What can we do to be pushing for the change that the world needs to see? Mm -hmm. We took them through the whole process, really. They began saying, we think we want to go carbon neutral. And we said, well, OK, let's have a look at what that really means. If you want to do that properly, first and foremost, you need to be cutting your own carbon in line with what the science needs, says needs to be happening. And then after that, if you want to go carbon neutral, um, OK, but any negative emissions, we need to have a very careful look at. So we ended up screening 65 um, reforestation and peat restoration projects. And out of those found five that we felt stacked up when you considered all the other things that are important, like biodiversity and, and social aspects, and are they really doing the things that they say they're doing and so on. And Brewdog ended up saying, well, we actually want to take twice as much carbon out of the air as, as, as our carbon footprint, because in, as a nod to, in, in recognition of the fact that actually these projects are currently cheaper than they should be. Right? These are all low hanging fruit that should have been hoovered up years ago. And then, but then the, 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 probably the most exciting part of the work with Brewdog is that they really get it that it affects everything the company should be doing. What you write on the beer cans, how you engage with your customers, how you lobby, how you push your industry, how you push your politicians. They really want it to integrate across you know, everything about what Brewdog thinks and does. Wow. Yeah, exciting company for us to work with. That's, yeah. that's brilliant, uh, yeah. And actually, that's, I, I follow that on the, on the news, of course. And uh, as uh, Stephen mentioned, we have a project uh, that we started inside uh, OGTC as well for our own carbon footprint, although it might not be uh, really as big because we're not a processing, uh, processing plant. But nevertheless, we want to set the example. So we'll, uh, we'll work on this in the starting the new year. Uh, but one thing that strikes me in a way is that um, it's great and uh, I would like to see that happening to all the businesses. But at the same time, you know, restoration, uh, pit restoration uh, or reforestation is clearly probably the most uh, attractive and the most urgent technology in inverted comma we should apply. So is there any reason why we're not doing that as a country? You know, why, why we're not uh, reforesting a lot of the highlands here or other places as a first action? Because, you know, as, as much as I'm a a big uh, um, supporter of the fact that we need to invest in CCS uh, and also in data that capture and etc. But your natural, natural, um, I call it natural sequestration is uh, probably a low hanging fruit, as you said. You know, we should we should uh, see a lot of trees being planted every day in every possible public uh, or private place. So that's not really happening. Are we waiting for COP twenty six or what? Right. The reason why it hasn't happened yet is because looking back, nobody has cared enough. You know, that's the hard reality of it. That's why Brewdog is taking twice as much out of the air as its carbon footprint. It's kind of a nod to the fact that there are low hanging fruit that should have been hoovered up years ago. But the good news is, my sense of it is that they are being hoovered up now. And for example, if you're looking to go carbon neutral by planting trees in the UK, you'd be well advised to get in there quick because, you know, there's only limited land and... You know, I, and I know one client that's had that example of they thought they'd bought some land to plant trees on and the people they were buying from cottoned on that there's a stampede for net zero going on and this land is more valuable than it used to be and they added a million pounds on the price tag. So, you know, I think uh, we're going to get to the point where all the cheap quality options have already been taken because all the natural, all the nature-based negative emissions solutions, heat restoration, tree planting, soil carbon sequestration, 
seagrass, pl planting seagrasses in, in the seabed, even enhanced rock weathering, even biochar, if you call that nature-based, but all those kinds of solutions are re fundamentally really, really finite. We need to do them all. And on top of that, we need to do the more technical solutions like direct air, carbon capture and storage. And we're gonna to need to do that as much as we can as well. And that's much more expensive. So my kind of, my hope is that we'll quite quickly get to the point where we've done all the nature-based stuff that we can. And anyone, anyone who wants to go carbon neutral from then on or offset, if you're prepared to use that word, their emissions will need to be paying the hundred dollars or so a ton that it's going to be for direct air, carbon capture and storage. So, so how far down the track are we in the UK when it comes to actually um, doing all the nature-based uh, work that we could possibly do? Are we 50% there or less or more? Oh no, we're less. We're less than that. We've really just started, but it's, uh, but it's, it's already getting to the point where the price of the land to go and do it is, is, is I think, starting to go up. My hope would be I mean, that it really won't be long before there is a lot of money going in to really doing the right thing with all the land in the UK. And it's important that when, when people are doing nature-based solutions, and, you know, especially in places where the land is so limited, like the UK, that they are doing the, a real high quality option. There's no, there's no scope for just planting up monocultures in, in the Scottish Highlands. You know, we need to take the time, pay the extra money, do the proper thing so we get some biodiversity that's really great for the community as well and just by the way turns out to be beautiful you know so but you know the stampede for net zero that we've seen over the last few months across the corporate world has i think been strong enough that i i'm hopeful that it won't be long before the land is basically spoken for and what about businesses like uh, small businesses i mean let's say we count ourselves with ogtc is a small business we're probably not going to be able to afford to go and buy a piece of land to, to um, you know, seed a forest. So yeah. how could we get involved? How could businesses like us get involved in, in those in those nature-based solutions? Okay, well, the most important thing, and I, I, I stress this to Brewdog, I stress this to all our clients, the most important thing by far is to be cutting your own carbon in line with what the science says needs to be happening. And that's something like 40% or so by 2030 and you know and going down to zero you know as soon as you can the world needs to be net zero by 2050 so and that there's no substitute for that and i think any any organization that's doing that can lay claim to be broadly responsible and if having done that you also want to go net zero and take the rest out of the air again then that's even better provided you do it in a high quality way and you know, there are there are um, schemes that you can buy into. I would advise being very careful about how you scrutinise those schemes. As a as a guide, if it's coming out at less than ten pounds a ton, it's almost certainly not as good as it looks. But you know, it's 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 a doable exercise. You know, as I say, for for Brewdog, we scrutinised sixty five certified schemes around the world and found five that we were happy with. It's really interesting. Look, I know you're in charge of the project to to reduce our own carbon footprint. Have you got any comments to make? I know we, we we look at that, those schemes uh, and uh, you know for, um, you mentioned Stephen buying land and plant tree, but you can also do this as a service. You know, mm -hmm. so it's, it's getting to these schemes, uh, and there are nature based and there are also um, uh, artificial storage based. Uh, you know, some of the company doing direct air capture are offering to subscribe and uh, and do that sequestration, although. Uh, Mike is totally correct. And, you know, the deep scrutinize needs to go into that to understand what you're actually paying for and uh, well, where the where the carbon goes and uh, and how long does it stay there. Um, but Mike, Mike, you raise a very important and interesting point uh, talking about land use. You know? and you mm. talk about that in your book as well. And uh, uh, you probably read the book by Dieter Helmer, uh, Net Zero. And there's also a big a big part of agriculture, not only land use. Uh, uh, but also the agriculture. And I think there's a big discussion going on in agriculture these days uh, uh, in terms of practices, uh, you know, as a kind of the, the thing that nobody usually talk about uh, or the mm. footprint of it. 
Um, and I think uh, just to add on that, uh, still on the land point, you mentioned monoculture, and I think one of the chapters in your book was uh, is biofuel bonkers. Yeah, which uh, I I love that uh, the title of the chapter and the argumentation. And so one of the ways in which we talk uh, we hear often, uh, or which is often portrayed as uh, a way to produce. Uh, energy with a negative carbon emission is uh, is max. I'm not convinced or I'm struggling to understand whether are we using land that we should use of to forestation or food production uh, to produce uh, pellets uh, and then maybe ship them around the world uh, to produce electricity in in such a, a plant or and that is bad right that that is like a, like that that is like monoculture for biofusion right. ending up in the forestation in the Amazon. Or uh, talking about uh, the waste product, uh, because uh, the main product goes actually into furniture or wood production or material construction, which is good. But what the situation with bio energy and, and CCS uh, around the world uh, is? Uh, is bonkers as biofuels, <laughs> or is it uh, oh. not a bad idea? It's it's broadly bonkers, but as a role for a small as a role for a small amount of it, and as you say, with with the with the genuinely unavoidable waste organic waste yeah you know bex looks like a great solution but if you look if you think about using land in order to do bex you know we've got well, there's only so much land in the world and with it we need to feed a growing population we need to manage our biodiversity that's currently hemorrhaging we need to cut our carbon footprint um you know we need to do all these things and if you look at the land requirement of producing um, organic matter for, as an energy source, it's just incredibly, um, it's just incredibly land intensive, and you know, so we can't do BEX in a in a you know as a big part of the global energy solution without putting incredible pressure on yeah. our food and biodiversity system. So it's more of a niche. Or it's a niche thing for the for the truly unavoidable organic waste. And maybe is a is a similar concept probably with the, when we look at oil and gas in the future, right? So uh, we have a we are we are still very dependent from oil and gas, and that has to change. So there's a decline uh, in oil and gas. So at the same yes, time, yes. it's a growth on uh, renewable and uh, hydrogen and etc. Uh, of course, uh, it's, it's more of a transition, not a switch. But you know, by some point, uh, we might have. Uh, we still need uh, to have uh, some oil and gas as a feedstock for some of the materials that we need for uh, uh, lightweight uh, vehicles uh, or uh, even for uh, um, renewables infrastructure. You know, so some of the, I mean, plastic is a great material or plastic based materials uh, when used uh, properly are good. And I think you also, may, I think the other book, uh, you may, made a good comparison of, uh, for example, of plastic bags and paper bags and plastic bags mm -hmm. have uh, or half of the the carbon footprint of a paper bag. The problem is they end up in the ocean. So, you know, that, that, there is yes. the recycling thing to bring uh, on board, but uh, we recycle as much as we can uh, copper for uh, electric cable. We should recycle as much can plastic, uh, but we still have to mine some copper and we still have to mine some plastic or oil uh, um, until this population is growing. So that, maybe that's an element. So in that perspective, one of the questions I have, does it matter where the oil or the gas come from and how it has been um, produced. You know, so the UK CS, uh, uh, the UK continental shelf uh, has uh, uh, 13, 14 megaton uh, a year of CO2 emission to produce oil and gas. It's for scope one emissions. And that's the first, first area that we are trying to address urgently. How do we electrify, how we decarbonize oil and gas production? But then the UK is still at the moment and for a while, uh, importing as a net importer so we are importing more gas and oil for somewhere else uh, of which we have no control so in a way we have control on what we produce here and we have no control on the commodity we're importing are we getting to a point and should we get to a point in which uh, where you buy or the carbon footprint of your oil matter just like uh, you know i and i think i'm sure you do but i look at the, the sugar or the coffee make sure that they don't come uh, from unethical sources so similarly, our virgin plastic materials should come probably from uh, oil we use in the most clean possible way, although that might be difficult to, to certify. <laughs> yeah, so there is, you know, there is a difference in, uh, 
in different sources and there's a, there are a, there's efficient production and less efficient production and sure that that makes a difference and we should buy from ideally from producers extracting efficiently um there might be some even more important questions in the ethics of who we buy from if if we need to buy such as are we sure that the, the company we're buying from is not in any way directly or indirectly funding any uh, climate denial lobbying, for example, oh, yeah. or you know anything like that. So all you know, all of that is probably even more, probably even more important than the efficiency of the extraction. I mean, I think the steepness of the trajectory that the uh, that the world's oil and gas consumption needs to go on is such that you know that's you know, that, that's the priority probably where it's sourced from, which country it's sourced from, is probably less important. That's a really interesting point because it's 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 a contrapoint to a, a lot of the thinking that's in the oil and gas sector here in the UKCS. I want to bring it back to to just shift gears a little bit and, and 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 kind of focus in on what the UK is busy laying groundwork for um, COP26. I mean, recently in the last month or so. The UK government announced the Green Industrial Revolution 10-point plan, which I'm sure you've um, you've digested thoroughly and have a, a few a few um, comments to make on it. Um, but what what struck me when reading it is um, the obviously there's a, a, a big um, focus on the growth of low carbon hydrogen. There's a big focus on carbon capital usage and storage I and mean, these are these are two areas that are, are particular uh con concern and importance to to our sector mm. the oil and gas sector as we as we begin our transition journey so getting your perspective on those two points in particular the the, the low carbon hydrogen production and its place in the uk's energy mix would be interesting and I'm really keen to hear what you have to say about CCUS as well. I know you've mentioned direct air capture, but um, just a kind of general conversation about about those two subjects in particular would be would be would be interesting to explore. Yeah, I think they're both really they're both really important technologies, huge technologies that the world is going to need to scale up, mm -hmm. and is going to need to scale up if it's going to meet its targets, um, and you know they haven't traditionally been profitable enough to attract the funding that they've needed in order to really scale up and get where they need to go. So, you know, I would welcome, I'd certainly welcome the government putting oomph behind those in its 10 point plan. I mean, overall, what I'd say about the 10 point plan is it's not enough. And, you know, it's about 40% of the funding that the Climate Change Committee said should be going in. And so it's not surprising when you look at it that it's not doing enough in all the places it could and that's a real shame because um you know the opportunities for really skilled worthwhile jobs you know in parts of the world that need those jobs as well you know to be sorting out our green agri our green infrastructure using now to really kickstart that kind of stuff hard in terms of um hydrogen and carbon capture and storage you know all of that is absolutely it's it's a huge growth area and just to give just to give one example so at the moment we've got a steel industry that is on the cusp of being able to make a commercially viable transition from using coking coal to make steel to using hydrogen as the reducing agent and it only takes say a carbon price of thirty dollars a ton or something and it suddenly becomes it suddenly becomes the cheapest way of doing it, it just needs a little bit of a push and the UK government at the moment is dithering around on this question about whether to open up a new coal mine on the west coast of Cumbria in order to get coking coal, in order to lock us in to an out, what will rapidly become an dated way of making steel that nobody's going to want in a world that's, that's transitioning to low carbon. You know, when the alternative is to get our hydrogen, you know, properly up to speed and use that to enable the steel industry to make that transition that it's just almost ready for. Yeah, Luca, you've been doing a lot of work in this area as well. So it's um, it's important to kind of get your perspective on industrial decarbonization and the role of hydrogen. Yeah, and one one uh, one other thing I hope uh, we'll have a good debate in some direction uh, at COP twenty six uh, is on this topic. You know, because uh, you know, Mike Mike mentioned the 
the carbon tax over 30 pounds per ton. And the challenge is how do you uh, enforce or establish something like that uh, global wise? Because at the moment, uh, the steel industry in the UK is uh, in, in not a great state uh, and in Europe uh, in general as well. And most of the steel or most of the cement, similarly, we import from uh, from China, which is uh, where it's produced with coal. And so you know, a, a carbon tax uh, of $30 per ton might make uh, steel produced by hydrogen uh, competitive with steel produced from coal in the UK. But the risk is that they just stop producing uh, in the UK or in Europe and we increase the import from China with uh, associated uh, uh, transport emission on top of the of the one for the production. So you know, that's what I, I hope the debate uh, at COP will be on uh, on that. And I think one of the solutions proposed uh, uh, recently was also the uh, that the European Union is about to implement, I think, you know, as part of the Green Deal, is the border carbon tax. You know, because, uh, yes. uh, and that shifts the perspective uh, as well from uh, the producing emission to the consumption emission. Yes. Uh, and that is a very important fact that so far has been somehow neglected. You know, the general public only know about the uh, production emission of the UK, and we went down 40%. Uh, and uh, most of that happened because we outsource uh, industrial production uh, elsewhere and imported back the product, and that doesn't count. So that, that's a, an important element also for CCS uh, when we apply CCS to our industry and to make sure that we can retain the industry, and retain the job, uh, and retain the value added uh, without the emissions as opposed to uh, exporting. The, the, you know, CO2 are this nasty habit of not stopping at the border. So it can be very green in the UK and not so big climate change at all. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I agree with everything you said there. And, you know, I, I, it's hard. I think it's hard to imagine a world that succeeds in leaving the fossil fuel in the ground fast enough um, without having a carbon tax. And it at some some you know or carbon price however however it's put about and a carbon tax is probably the is probably the easiest way of planting it and what do you do if you've got an interim situation in which it's not going on all over the world the last thing you want to be doing is giving competitive advantage to the, the, you know the, the countries that aren't playing the game the way to get around that is to have uh, a tax on the border absolutely what about all carbon cap check your usage uh, question Luca? um it's 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 something that um, obviously we've got a project um, in kind of trying to get up off the ground here in Scotland with the ACON yeah. project. Um, but there are a couple of other projects throughout the UK and the prospect of pricing for carbon could well, as Mike, you've said, for hydrogen and, and, and manufacturing processes, if you have a proper, proper mechanism for actually identifying how much CO2 costs that could absolutely kickstart a CCUS industry. Um, and we could see that developing very quickly, I think. But um, I, I just wonder what your perspective is on that, because it's it's something that I think we do need, and we need it very quickly. Is that for me or for Mike? Uh, for, for either one of you. I, I do think there are two key elements that we need to um, to unlock or to define to unlock the hydrogen in CCUS. And one is uh, is commercial or normative, you know, and it is about the carbon tax. And carbon tax shouldn't be, in my view, a specific amount. It is more of a flexible mechanism that needs to, you know, need to start somewhere and then uh, adjust to a market. Because uh, I believe that the way to create an economy, a hydrogen economy, and to create a, a CCS uh, um, working solution is uh, to make to create a market for it. And, and that's what we need, uh, I think, from the, um, from the regulators, uh, from the government, uh, you know, a, a clear direction and something that is also um, give a sense of uh, confidence that we're going to stay there as a regulation for some years, because these projects are massive, uh, uh, require massive investment of capital for many, many years. You cannot do, go there and do, start doing them lightly if you don't have a confidence that the regulation is stable enough. And the other thing there is the technology, you know, because all this technology is still uh, quite relatively young. So, yes, we have uh, the technology to start doing low regret projects uh, like Acorn or T-Side or others, uh, but there's still plenty of room to reduce the cost of hydrogen production, such as we reduce the cost of uh, uh, offshore wind in the past 15 years. Uh, and part of that comes from uh, deploy and learn by doing, economy of scale, 
but part of that comes from research and development and looking at the new solution, new solvent, new electrolyzers uh, that can change the game. And that's where I think is an opportunity for the UK to do that in order to be the first to accelerate and deploy this technology and, and go quickly and set an example in uh, reducing the emission. And the sooner we start, the better, because we can put uh, a nice, uh, you know, a nice example at COP26. Uh, but we should also invest in developing that supply chain and that technology domestically and become in the future, hopefully, an exporter of that technology for other basin, as opposed to importing the technology, which is what we basically do for uh, most of the offshore wind that we're installing at the moment. Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, I think if you're, if you're, you know, the UK planning out your strategy, you've either got to, and you're wondering which way the world's going to go, you've either got to say, well, the world's not going to get on, broadly speaking, not going to get on top of the climate emergency, in which case you've really got to plan for a pretty dark scenario. Or you've got to say the world will, actually, we'll wake up, we'll make the transition. And if that's going to happen, then it is as clear as daylight that um, carbon capture and storage and hydrogen technologies and some of these other emerging technologies are going to be incredibly valuable. And any company, that, any country that's been smart enough to invest in it as far ahead of the game as it can get is going to be extremely well placed. Yeah, and I think that's, I mean, that's our perspective here at OGTC as well. I mean, we've just produced a, a, a report called Integrating Energy Vision and um, so reimagining a net zero North Sea. And at the heart of it, we have the opportunity to look at hydrogen production and um, obviously CCS is involved in that too. Um, so it's, it's something that um, we feel is is definitely the future for for energy, offshore energy production is this integration of two energy systems. But I'm, I'm just going to come, I'm really curious though, I mean, coming back to the whole COP situation then, Mike, have you, have you actually attended any of these COPs before? Have you been to one? I haven't been into this sort of inner sanctum. I've, I've been in sort of, um, you know, meetings around, around the edges. Like so what that. can we expect in your view when, um, when, when it rolls into town, when it comes to Glasgow in November, what, what type of, uh, activities can we expect to see well i hope we'll see um you know a very clear sense that the public is making clear that it's expectation of people from every country that are involved in the, the negotiations and the discussions are you know really un, really under pressure to make them work and make it clear that their country is part of helping make it work i mean i hope there will be a sense that Every politician understands that their career depends on being part of the solution in this. And, you know, I think I think the UK government can expect that at that COP, be under scrutiny over from the UK public over what it's saying and doing and the extent to which it's got its ducks in a line and the extent to which it's showing leadership. And I think you know, now is a good time for everybody to be clear that people will really be quite discerning be okay to have glossed over a bit of greenwash that sounds sounds nice at face value that will get picked into you know it's either, it's either going to stack up be robust be a meaningful response that's coming out of the uk that's in line with the level of the crisis that we're in in which case we'll come out looking good on the global stage we'll be part of the solution and you know i think it'll work out if you you know it, as a piece of pr for the uk it'll work out well and it will help the, the talks to go well and I think if it's, you know, if it's, if it doesn't, if it's not quite, as, if it's not quite as robust as it, as it looks, then I think the cracks will show. Yeah. I mean, and what's, your, what's the perspective for the oil and gas industry in, in, in the UK when it comes to COP? I know there's a lot of voices that basically say we, we don't, no company that's involved in oil and gas extraction should be, should be allowed to even take part in anything to do with COP. But um, is, is, is that, is that actually, um, the right way to approach this should we not be engaging in the conversation and, and having that light that light of public uh, scrutiny upon activities shone on onto what the, the, the sector's doing and if you if you don't allow them to take part then surely that's a, an opportunity missed absolutely would agree with that and it's the way that taking part happens so you know there's a you know critically important is the transparency around all of this the transparency uh you know the transparency around funding you know i think it's uh i'd certainly be wary of any situations in which the the money behind any parts of the process 
come from an industry that could have a vested interest in in uh, in your in the outcomes going a certain way. Um, I think that's something to be really wary of. And I think one of the things is that the world the world needs to trust it. And I think I think this is um, yeah this is important for the whole of the COP process. Uh, you know, so at the moment in the world today, it's quite hard to know who and what to trust. And in this process, we really really need to be able uh, to trust what's going on. And in terms of the role of the oil and gas industry, you know, it's, it's important that it has a very transparent, open and honest role in it. And it's important that the world respects that, you know, here is an industry that has uh, woken up over the last few decades to some quite difficult news for its business proposition. And, uh, you know, needs to be, we need to be respectful of that. And we need to, you know, help it with the transition that needs to take place in line with what the science says needs to be happening. Yeah, to totally agree. And I think, you know, we, we, we run the risk sometimes to, to look at one industry, whatever industry, oil and gas or others, as a single monolith uh, with a decision making uh, or, or uni united intention, unit of intention. And that, that's not the case. You know, the oil and gas industry has various nuances and many companies are, uh, are on the different stage of the awareness uh, and commitment uh, and actually doing something to the transition. So it's important that uh, we engage uh, in a transparent way and, and have that conversation. And of course, uh, you know, we got the, the pioneer and the laggards, but you know, one should be, be helped to pull the others as opposed to push, uh, push back. And, uh, and that, I think you know, the, the, the industry has an enormous potential because of the infrastructure, the skills, the innovation, the technology, the overall in innovation or ecosystem uh, of the oil and gas industry is a, is a formidable platform to build uh, the new net zero solution, you know, reusing uh, those skills, those infrastructure, those uh, technology for carbon capture, for hydrogen, for everything else. That, that's where the skills are. So it's important to have that level of engagement, I guess. One, one thing I wanted to, to touch briefly is, uh, you know, we, um, is, is COVID. We cannot uh, end up without talking about COVID. Um, COVID has shown uh, two things, I think. Uh, one is that uh, we can change behaviors rapidly and we can uh, do different things very quickly when uh, there is an emergency. And uh, the fact that we're having this uh, podcast uh, from different locations as opposed to sitting in the same uh, table with a central microphone, uh, the fact that we are all have been attending uh, conferences uh, and uh, without leaving our homes uh, and therefore reducing the individual carbon footprint, uh, but also be more efficient. So how do we move, uh, you know, how, how, what, what should we do differently? Because uh, we keep talking about going back to normal, but normal wasn't very good. Uh, we, we had a massive carbon footprint we were uh, not in a in a great situation so we shouldn't go back to that normal we should uh, go back to a better normal and uh, does that mean that we will stop traveling for holidays uh, that we stop traveling for work uh, or we reduce that uh, you know how how do we does it mean we have a different model for the development country to aspire to because we have to go somewhere else uh, so what, what do you think about that what's the the post-COVID world uh, from an environmental perspective? Well, you know, the pandemic has shown us that change is possible. It hasn't been much fun, but it's shown us that we are capable of much more change than most people of my generation assumed was possible because, you know, in the UK, especially, you know, people of my generation, to be honest, most of us haven't really known that much change. Um, it's been a very stable world. So, so change is possible. Um, and, you know, there are some things, you know, we have learned through the pandemic that some things uh, work better than we thought they did. You know, working from home works better than a lot of us thought it did. You know, I've learned that um, it's great to work from home one or two days a week. I've also learned that it's not great for me to work at home five days a week, right? You know? <laughs> Um, but that's a shift in the right direction. So, you know, what we, what we can do as we come out of this pandemic, you know, we, it's an opportunity to 
absolutely not go back to normal. It's an opportunity to choose how we're going to live afresh. All our old habits are broken. And now let's put back together new habits in a way that works for the world. And, you know, and that doesn't mean to say zero flying, but it does mean less flying because there's a hard reality on that one. Uh, we don't know how to put a, a low carbon airplane on a long haul flight yet. And we're quite a long way, way away from knowing how to do that. Um, yeah, so it's, and, and in terms of economic recovery, you know, the way we frame that up, it's such an opportunity to uh, just, um, you know, push the, push the support into things that are not just good for economy and jobs, but also good for the green world. I mean, we have to take that chance. I think that that's absolutely important because that also means acting on the demand, you know, for fossil fuels. Because uh, if you want to have a transition from fossil fuel to uh, to clean uh, power and electricity, it's not just electricity, it's also power. You know, there's a need to find a technology replacement uh, affordable and comparable, or to make them comparable and affordable through some sort of a carbon tax intervention. But there's a need to act on the demand side. Because uh, and, and reduce the demand for it, and, and that uh, might take some time. But um, with the right incentive uh, and uh, the right inspiration, <laughs> that's something to aspire to. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I think some of the some changes will absolutely happen now. So I think if you look at the air, the uh, aircraft industry, you know, I think um, the aviation industry, I think. Um, you know, the writing was starting to be on the walls. You know, the world was waking up to the very high carbon footprint of air travel. And it could have kind of resisted that up to a point for a few more years. But I think having had all the habits broken, you know, I think now it's not the world of having a no flying world, but we'll never go back to quite the same amount of flying quite so readily. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, as someone who trained in economics, uh, I still find uh, bustling that, uh, and, and I live far away from where my parents live, but it's always uh, cheaper to fly. It used to be cheaper to fly than to go by train, and it's cheaper to take my kids to school by car than getting them on the bus. And that's contrary to logic when you look at the carbon footprint, though. I right? saw. So, mm -hmm. That's, yeah, the world shouldn't, shouldn't work like that. Guys, fantastic conversation. Thank you so much. Uh, Luca, over to you. Thank you. No, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure, like always, sir. It's an exciting time in our industry, so please take it all in, get involved. And if you have any questions, get in touch with us via our website at OGTC.com. You can also follow us on our social media channels, LinkedIn, Twitter and YouTube for all the latest updates.